so many amazing choices. It's just constant, constant amazing choices. Andrew Chesworth. Oscar nominated. Animator and director. He's a great guy and he has a lot of cool things to say. In late 2008, pitched that I wanted to do this Melody Time kind of throwback short. And then in 2009, we recorded the music and I storyboarded it. 2010, I didn't really work on it. 2011, I animated most of that opening sequence. So I thought if I post at least this opening sequence online, then it got quite a reaction, like 8 million views worth of reactions pretty quickly. One thing both of my shorts have in common, One Small Step and The Brave Locomotive, is they are both very much in love with the legacy of Pinocchio. I've probably seen it 20 times. 21st time was as delightful as the other 20. It's almost character before story. There's a timelessness to the, the tragedy in the film. A film populated by villains. Every sort of element of the filmmaking is supporting contrast and irony to kind of make it make it feel clever and make it feel self-aware. But then the fact that it's got all those things, but it goes way out of its way to be one of Disney's most entertaining movies. All the Nine Old Men, the original Disney animators, Babbitt and Tightlip, they didn't do stuff this interesting and layered for literal decades. There was almost half a century of less than compared to Pinocchio. I just wanted to impart to everyone listening like, I'm always so curious, and I usually start most of my conversations this way, is tell me why drawing and moving that drawing appealed to you. Was there a moment in your life where you're just like, oh, shit, this seems like the right thing? I think it started before I could intellectualize it that way. But I do have very specific memories of seeing Dumbo. Uh, on our television growing up in Jessup, Maryland at when I was maybe three years old uh, and like the Good Morning Mickey anthology of shorts from the 1930s, 40s and 50s they played on the Disney Channel back then this was the, the late 1980s uh, and I also remember seeing Melody Time which very much inspired my short The Brave Locomotive uh, on TV with my babysitter and it was like teenage girl in our neighborhood was watching me and my sister and melody time was on and i specifically remember the little toot segment with the tugboat and the andrews sisters singing and something about the look and sound and feel of that just like lodged into my brain whatever that is it's magic to me and i want to i want to engage with that uh, and i also showed an interest in drawing at a young age you hear a lot of animators and animation directors saying i told stories with my drawings at a young age and I, I relate to that as well. I, I probably started drawing comics or the idea of a comic before I even knew what that was. Just drawing stories. So I think, I think just the magic of animation and the interest in drawing always fused this idea in my head that, yeah, of course, that's what I'm going to do someday. It's hard for... I never imagined doing anything else, which is a strange thing. Maybe briefly in high school when I, I saw the Star Wars and Indiana Jones films for the first time, or may, not so much high school, maybe more middle school, when I was 12 or 13 when the special editions came out. That was my introduction to like the Lucasfilm, Steven Spielberg world. And for a bit, I thought maybe I would do visual effects because I loved those films so much. And then during the Pixar revolution, uh, Toy Story and Monsters, Inc., I, I really started thinking, you know, maybe animation is what I want to do after all. I think that kind of captures all of my interests more than visual effects does. It's just so funny, isn't it, that <clears throat> most people who are in this field, they're either come back to it later in life when they've realized actually this sort of career is a bit of a mistake um, or it's <laughs> it's <laughs> like it just doesn't see, speak to your soul or it... Um, it's something that there was never any choice, right? There's just no yeah. choice. Looking through the thread of your work, you can see how something like Melody Time would definitely inspire you. It, you know, you've you've done a lot of shorts and tests, and you're so generous in being able to put those out there for people to see. Like you're not hiding any of that. It's not locked behind some content. It's all on YouTube. There, like even before the Brave Locomotive, you've got things like wild west and you, you you kind of are always gearing toward this ultimate goal um, 
but storytelling i think is is also a a big aspect of drawing because there's some people who just want to animate right they're just happy to animate but they they're not interested in telling a story from their heart right they just love the drawing process but then you've got other people who want to tell stories with their drawing you know what is it in you that wants to say something that's a great question i mean i think it's a natural it's a natural state of the human condition to want to tell stories whether you're a filmmaker or a person with a traditional job i think just telling stories is how we connect with each other and animation is just such an entertaining way to tell stories and create characters and Speaking of what we're going to talk about today, Pinocchio, the reason I love Pinocchio is because it's all about character. It's almost character before story, but story through character. And I think if you come up with a character that excites you, with a personality that's engaging or a drive that is interesting or just compelling to to watch, the story kind of just manifests out of that. And in the case of uh, all the films that I've made, it, it's even funny that you mentioned Wild West. That was a short that was going to be my thesis film in college, but it was too ambitious, too many characters, too many set pieces, just too too big. I didn't know how to manage that scope when I was in school, uh, that it ended up becoming sort of my first directing gig uh, out of college. And we were able to sort of superimpose that concept onto just this conference opener for this commercial uh <laughs> commercial event yeah and it's bend funny it to because your I'm, will yeah yeah we we sort of bent it to our will <laughs> and my producer uh danny Ravashkin, he he told me later that the conference committee was not thrilled with how sort of indifferent the material was to the logos <laughs> it's like, because there's yeah, a yeah, great that, there's, a, there's a great comment i think in that video which is like when you, when your movie has too many uh, logo openings, it's so like it's so <laughs> clear. <laughs> oh god! Yeah, I mean, in college, I just pitched it to my my professors as like a madcap Tim Burton take on on the old west, kind of like Nightmare Before Christmas, but the old west and not holiday themed. Uh, and and that it was originally going to be a uh, full three D, like just not the sort of two and a half D paper doll thing that we did, but it's funny that the paper doll thing was just a product of, of uh, resources and scope. Like how, what if we did it kind of like flash style, but all in Maya with puppets and we can just sort of flip them, you know, horizontally whenever they need to turn their head or something, we'll just do like a little dip <laughs> with a negative scale to it. And then the train is 3d, but it's like two and a half D, you know, if you see it from the top view, it's sort of sheared. Uh, with a fake perspective to it, it's just modeled that way. Um, but but yeah, that that short was just how do we how do we do this big ambitious thing, but it, on a budget with with, with other like, people's money, yeah, with other <laughs> with other people's money, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I, I I think that film has one of my favorite musical scores of anything I've worked on. It was just this Steve Warner who did uh, the score for my other film, One Small Step. That was one of our first collaborations was on Wild West and he just kind of like blew me away with this score that he just whipped out that was like mixing spaghetti western and kind of more 1940s western, like all these different brands into one big set piece is really cool. Well, it's, it's fascinating then that music is like such a central part of your storytelling personal storytelling focus like one small step is a great example of that and the first time i ever watched that i was utterly blown away by the sensitivity of the story and the kind of feel of the world where everything just has this kind of I, i'm gonna say delicious but that's not what i mean you know you know that kind of i, I know a, that this, i know what you mean though yeah you know what i mean it has this nice tint of color and um beautiful roundedness to it as well and that was i remember being such i was so hurt that that film came out the year it came out and was and congratulations on the nomination that year because you were up against as far as i remember an irish short film in the same category which was <laughs> um i'm pretty sure 
it was the same year that uh, Sunday the car- afternoon. The Cartoon Saloon film, right? Cartoon Saloon, Louise's one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was just like, God damn, because I have to love the Cartoon Saloon one being Irish, and I did. <laughs> but I was just like, this other one, One Small Step, is just this perfect short. Like, it's it's everything a short film needs to be. Oh, that's that's a, wow, that's a... First of all, thank you. Uh, that, <laughs> well, when we made that short, when Bobby and I made that short, mm. we kind of wanted it to be like, if we only made one film, what would we want to say with that film and how would we want it to be? And, and the fact that it came off that way for you really means a lot. Um, the fact that people get out of it what the creators put into it is always a special feeling. But speaking of all the other shorts that we were with that year that were nominated... I mean, I got to meet all the filmmakers. I loved all of the films. Like every single one of them to me deserved to win. And it was just a matter of like what the appetite was that year. I mean, my personal favorite was actually um, outside of, you know, the bias I had towards our film. My favorite was (laughs) Trevor Jimenez's film Weekends because it was so deeply personal and so fearless the way that he was able to talk about his upbringing in that way with such a unique style and such a, a strong cinematic point of view, not just in terms of the visuals, but like the sound design, the use of music with the mother playing the piano. And whenever he goes to his father's house, there's sort of like the 80s rock and roll music. <laughs> and then he goes to his mom's house and it's quiet and she's playing the piano. And it's he's just using using the, the the audio experience to tell the story as much as um, his drawings. Generally, the shorts every year are pretty phenomenal. You know, they're pretty exceptional. Every single short films, and when they're, you know, if we talk about Oscar nominations, the selection is always amazing. But there's something about One Small Step that has always stuck with me. Always, it. I don't know what it is. It just feels like a world you could live in, and I think that's a beautiful thing, right? And when I think then about when I heard about the Brave Locomotive, and obviously that was, you had uh, released the kind of concept work for that. How would you describe it? Like a, a, a it was like an uh, yeah on, on YouTube. It's it's labeled as like the opening sequence. Yes, work in progress, and that work was progress, basically yeah. the the state of the film. Even though I put it on YouTube in 2015, it was really the state of the film circa. 2011 or so like around the time i was hired at disney <laughs> yeah. so i um quite a quite a long time yeah. yeah it was a long time i mean that's why i posted it online so the the summary of the film was in late 2008 uh, i met with the composer and i pitched that i wanted to do this melody time kind of throwback short um and then in 2009 we recorded the music and i storyboarded it 2010 i didn't really work on it i did the Palm Spring short and a few other commercial things that really captured my attention. Then in 2011, I animated most of that opening sequence and then I was hired by Disney. So it was, it was kind of like this thing I did on the side for a couple years. And then when I was hired at Disney, it really got put in a drawer. I mean, I would kind of chip away at it for like a day or two here and there, like a couple times a year, but it was in the same way that somebody compulsively makes a drawing and posts it on Instagram Like, that's kind of how I would work on the film for my time at Disney. It was sort of like, ah, it's been a few months. I'll do like a scene on the Brave Locomotive. Why not? It was like that. And it wasn't something that was always cooking. And in 2015, so much time had gone by. I turned 30 that year. And I was just thinking about what I'd done up to that point and what I was looking ahead to. and, And I wanted all the work I had done on Brave Locomotive not to just disappear so I thought if I post at least the most finished part of it, this opening sequence online, maybe it'll be appreciated and I can see what kind of reaction it gets. And then it got quite a reaction, like 8 million views worth of reactions pretty quickly. And so that kind of put this idea in the back of my head, like in a few years when I've got my my mind put together about it, I'll I'll find a way to finish it. But it'll be in an organized manner, like a Kickstarter or something to that effect. And then five years later, the pandemic hit and I decided maybe I'll do uh, a Patreon. So I would say 15 years in the making, but really like kind of two meaningful years at the front and then two and a half meaningful years at the back. So 
that makes a little bit more sense in the context of uh, a production. Because somebody at Disney once told me, if you make a film on your own, you're moving at about 25% productivity as if you were doing it for your job. So if it takes a year or a year and a half to do a film at a studio, a short, even the Disney shorts, you know, like Paper Man or Feast, they take about a year or more to do. So kind of working within that four to five year overall production timeline is about right, considering the the comparative nature. But I, what I love about it as well, uh, um, not just the short, but it's actually it's a piece of work that you finish right you're fi you're finishing these <laughs> yeah. things it's not just something in the back pocket of like oh one day i'll get to it you've you you're able to build these bridges and complete them and and then move on and start building another bridge right which kind of lends to me i know it's a long period of time right and when that uh, when you finally released it online it had an incredible reaction you know really good and it's done very well at the the festival circuits and for a very good reason, because and actually, sorry, I didn't mean to want to talk about this short just yet, but I am. I think it's so critical to kind of have that message of just don't worry about how long it takes and just keep chipping away at something and then finish it right. But obviously, you had a good reaction to something that you put out as a test. And you use that as a leverage to kind of make your Patreon then in your head. And then that yeah. had a good reaction as well. And then you're able to actually say, here's money to finish this, right? And Yeah, yeah. And obviously with the money gives you time as well, you know, because yeah. you're working at Disney. You're working at, you know, you've had a very interesting career as, in terms of the kind of work that you've done and then ending up in Klaus and all the and my dad the bounty hunter all these kind of amazing projects that you've been a part of um but at the same time amongst all that you managed to put out one of the best short films <laughs> in a long time you know so that's astounding to me oh that that's very kind and i mean it was sort of it was definitely a game of patience um, and knowing when the right moment to strike was in terms of um, launching a crowdfunding strategy and reaching out to the right people who might help me. I mean, if I hadn't worked on Klaus, I probably wouldn't have had the courage to ask most of those artists who helped me, like Mael Gormelan and Slavin Reese and Sam Kavanagh and many, many other talented animators who basically own sections of characters in the short. And it was... Another instinctive bit of good fortune that I never animated like the Baron or any of the characters after that opening sequence because the other animators from Klaus kind of got to own those characters. Like Sam did almost every shot of the foreman with the whip and Mael did the hero shots of the Baron singing to Henry and and Sam, uh, sorry, Slavin did um, Henry's wife in the middle of the film, in the cabin, and then at the end of the film in the 1945 time jump. So there's a consistency, I think, among the characters because I was able to give animators ownership over those moments. And I think that's something that we'll probably end up talking about when we move on to Pinocchio. But, you know, it's something I've noticed in your own work is even your sketches you've and the opening shot of the brave locomotive, this control of shape and space is just unbelievably phenomenal how you're controlling those carts or the little carriages going down and i've even in uh one small step and stuff you can still not to the same degree but you can see a control in terms of how characters are held but when it comes to the brave locomotive the the space the lighting the control of shape your strong staging all this all this stuff is just, it comes true. And, and thankfully, you've put your storyboard reel <laughs> of the whole short online. You know? You've got so many different <laughs> <It's> versions. Just... <laughs> somebody, <laughs> somebody, I think, made a comment like, this is like the YouTube poop version of Brave Locomotive. And I was <laughs> cracking up at that. Because I, when, I, when I storyboarded it, 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 it's like I had my own style of storyboarding back in 2009 that it doesn't look like my storyboards now. Like when I storyboard now, it looks, I don't know, a little bit more like my rough animation, I guess, to, to put it simply. But back in 2009, I was storyboarding so frequently for commercials that we were doing that I had like a shorthand that, and it was almost like, um, 
I remember being inspired by like Quentin Blake a little bit, like just sort of like put the lines down and don't overthink it. Just tell the story and move on. And, and I, back then I remember thinking like these boards are so crappy and I was so hard on myself, <laughs> but I was just trying to get it done because it was a yeah. personal project. But looking back on it now with like, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 years of hindsight, I actually enjoy those storyboards in a way that I didn't at the time because it's like a different version of myself made them. And I I kind of aspire to continue to have that same just, I don't know, fearlessness and drive that I had when I was younger because yeah. it was so productive. It was so productive. <laughs> but it's a, like I like the word fearless because... I, it's so hard to, when you see the thread of your work, it's really hard to separate the stages out. But when you post something like the storyboard version versus the pencil test version, <laughs> like so, <laughs> it's like day and night nearly. And you can yeah. see that. Whereas I was always curious, what what is the next thing after Klaus that gives me kind of um, hope for hand-drawn animation in the west well right? uh, if, if you want to have some hope related to klaus and hand-drawn i mean sergio pablos's film after klaus i mean to make like a snow white pinocchio comparison uh, in one of our exchanges before this talk i said pinocchio was like the empire strikes back of the disney yes. brand it's like yes. the second yeah. outing is just like a you haven't seen anything yet. Like, wait till you see what's up our sleeve now. It's like they had this Titanic level success with Snow White, just like Star Wars was a Titanic success. And then the second film is just, it's its so, you only live once, right? Like, just what can we put into the second outing that will just knock people's socks off and push the art form that we're, that we're engaging with here? But, um... I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you were talking about Sergio's next... Uh... Sergio's next thing. Yeah, Sergio's next film. I got to storyboard on Ember. Um, yes. Yeah. I don't think it's any secret that that film is called Ember. I think there was a Cartoon Brew release about it. And uh, he, he showed some of it at CTN here in Burbank a few months ago. And even though Netflix uh, decided not to proceed with the film, he still owns the rights to that material. And when I was storyboarding on it, it was about two years ago as of last month the animation tests I saw and the production design I saw it was just jaw dropping there was an animation test of one of the main characters by Sergio Martins who did uh, Alva in Klaus and it had the same advanced lighting techniques applied to it as Klaus but the way that they were lighting it and the way that it was staged it almost looked like Planet Earth meets Klaus, right? <laughs> they were going for like a more oh, natural, okay. naturalistic, wow. like nature documentary look to the lighting and the feel and the camera work, but it was still had the level of caricature that, you know, that Klaus offered. It was a little more naturalistic. I mean, kind of like comparing Emperor's New Groove to Tarzan or something. There was like a, a, slight, a slight difference in naturalism, but the same feeling the same kind of just bold design and and uh luxurious craft i'm really excited <laughs> for that then because i've been I, I really hope it gets made i mean yeah whoever whoever makes ember with sergio that's going to be like a, a legacy piece i mean when we were working on it there was this feeling of no matter what year this movie comes out it's going to be the 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 one that everyone talks about because nothing else will even come close to looking like it yeah i think Sir sergio's out there just trying to continue that tradition of like pinocchio and fantasia we're like if we're gonna do this let's really do it and that is magnetic for artists who who love the craft and we've been dancing around pinocchio a lot here so let's just <laughs> this is all relating to pinocchio yeah. let's just funnel it back everything I, I, I do want to say though one yeah. thing pinocchio both of my shorts have in common, One Small Step and The Brave Locomotive, is they are both very much in love with the legacy of Pinocchio. I mean, with One Small Step, uh, it, all the, the art direction and colors that you were that you were complimenting, that really is 
a tribute to my co-director, Bobby Pontias, who's a fabulous designer and a fabulous um, art director. And the look of the film, the, the colors, the vibrancy of it, that all comes from him, as well as the initial character designs. And we collaborated on maybe how those designs would adapt to 3D animation, but I mean, he really owns the look of that film. And I really got to own, I feel like the editing and the use of music and sort of some of the tonal flavors of like, what can we borrow from films like Pinocchio? Because the thing I love about Pinocchio uh, that I wanted one small step to have was that that timeless, pure kind of love between a parent and a child. And I wanted the, that there to be like a magical feeling to that, an aspirational feeling to that, and a bit of a, a, a fleeting kind of melancholy that you feel like this is so potent that it's it's a moment that when it's past, it's like it was it was special, but now it's past. Like there's a feeling that Pinocchio gives me that feels like that, and so I wanted to imbue that in our film about this single father and his young daughter who are just trying to make it in uh, Northern California, and she's got this dream that's very different than his life experience, but he wants to help her achieve that dream and it, it, with Pinocchio it's like you don't see Pinocchio like working hard at school and graduating from college but <laughs> there's sure a feeling don't. but there's a feeling uh, of effort in the film like the dream is earned because the characters really are put through their paces and have to have to kind of sacrifice or, or give a lot of themselves to achieve their their goal and that was something that Bobby and I wanted our film to have too so even though Pinocchio is kind of more rooted in fantasy and magic and our film was more rooted in, in uh, I guess, the real world, we still wanted there to be a, an emotional and spiritual connection to the way that the art and the music make you feel. When you said Pinocchio, of course, I was very happy. But, you know, you mentioned as an early influence to you, Melody Time, or, yeah. you know, you could even pick sequences out of Dumbo that kind of seem yeah. more like Casey Jr. or The Train and stuff like that. That's so right. So why, yeah. why was Pinocchio the choice for you? Um, I feel like I have more to say about Pinocchio as it relates to my overall values as an animator. I feel like my, my love of Melody Time is more specific to The Brave Locomotive which when I pitched it to Tom Hamilton, the composer, I, I said it's like Casey Jr. Uh, and Little Toot meets Pecos Bill, where like instead of a cowboy <laughs> and his horse, it's an engineer and his train. But it's going to be narrated like by the Andrews sisters style voices, just like Little Toot, the tugboat. And we're going to have a big set piece at the end of the film where the train has to prove himself, just like Little Toot saving the ship from the storm. Uh, I kind of went into the pitch directly referencing flavors I wanted to capture from Disney. And so Melody Time had all those flavors I was looking for. And even with the human characters, like the Baron and, and Henry, I kind of pitched it to the animators as like Johnny Appleseed and the Guardian Angel. Like, I want that style of human animation. So it was like every section from Melody Time kind of got a little <laughs> nod in the film. <laughs> And even the 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 different sequences, like I wanted the Samson sequence to ha have a different feeling than the opening and the Baron song should have its own flavor. So it's like a six minute short with like six sequences in it, but each sequence has its own kind of identity uh, that still carries together in one long uh, story thread. But, but yeah, Mel Melody Time, I would say I don't watch it as often as um, I do Pinocchio. Pinocchio is one that I revisit when I, I'm looking for like really deep, potent craft inspiration. And Melody Time is one that it, it's just kind of delights me. <laughs> it's like can candy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I associate Melody Time with obviously the amazing, hilarious animation from Pecos Bill, but I, I associate Melody Time very much with like the little toot segment and that childhood memory and and just sort of enchantment that i felt watching it obviously when we've been when we were skirting around pinocchio earlier we talk about things like or you were talking i didn't talk about it um <laughs> where you mentioned things like the second outing for disney 
right? And they really, yeah. I, I honestly feel, I heard a quote before and it's always stuck with me for Pinocchio where it was like, now we're going to show you there are no limitations to what we can do, right? And this, yeah. we're just going to put everything into this film because a lot of people will uh, cite Pinocchio as being one of the first strong uses of personality for driving storytelling, right? That's right. And also on top of that, you've got the pinnacle of early Disney music for that time before, obviously before Fantasia, that the the key song in it is Disney's theme song. Um, and then on top of that, you also have incredible effects animation that you've never seen before, you know, in the monstro sequence and yeah. even anything underwater. To me, it just felt like they weren't hot holding anything back. And it's funny because they were originally going to do Pinocchio as their third film, but Walt felt that the animators weren't ready to tackle the technical needs of a film like Bambi to kind of look at these more naturalistic animals for, for over an hour. And uh, with Pinocchio, he felt like from a character perspective and sort of a design perspective, it was something they knew how to do already but just not at the scale that they were aspiring to do. There was a level of spectacle to Pinocchio that that was like the biggest hurdle for them. But but then, like you said, the personalities in it, they're so rich. I just watched the film again yesterday to have it very fresh in my mind. And I was just, I'd, I'd probably seen it 20 times. And it, like the 21st time was as delightful as the other 20. It, it's just such a... Capture! It's just such a captivating film. Like every character is delightful. When mm. Honest John shows up, you're like, yes. Oh, <laughs> when he's the best. Stromboli <laughs> shows up, you're like, yes. <laughs> uh, every character is just so fun to watch and so present. It feels very physical and very just present as a as a story. Nobody feels two dimensional um, in terms of their personality or or depictions. And even like Christian Rubb as Geppetto, that voice with Art Babbitt's animation and the little jitters in his hands that he took the time to animate, like it just feels, I don't know, very, very present and tangible as a character. And I always, as a kid, remember watching Pinocchio and feeling very safe with Geppetto, like that. The oh, with Geppetto. The I, I was like, yeah, with the yeah. film, wow. This Not is with the film. The film is a very yeah. unsafe story, but <laughs> but the yeah, whenever Geppetto's around, you kind of feel like everything's going to be okay. <laughs> like, it gives That's you that, yeah, that feeling. He, he does have this wonderful quality to him. Um, you know, even... <laughs> He just doesn't seem phased by anything at all. You know, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. He's in the whale and he's just like, well, we might starve to death. And then <laughs> he's just like, come on. He's like, oh, well, you know, or or he's just like, oh, Pinocchio, you're dead. Stop talking. He's like, I'm not dead. I'm alive. And he's like, oh, you're alive. You know, he's either delighted or just fine. And there's never a kind of a below that. And I absolutely love that choice. Yeah, he's a resilient character. He's a Zen master. <laughs> very, very resilient, yeah. <laughs> I guess the real tragedy of Gebetto is like he's he's so uh, alone. He has cats and fish and has to make a wooden boy to kind of... <laughs> yeah, he's sustain. an interesting character. He's kind of... I, I always felt like there was a side to Gebetto, you know, like maybe he had, a, he had an unconventional lifestyle that he wasn't <laughs> able to express. <laughs> at the time period that he lived in but then as an old man he's like you know it would have been nice if i lived the kind of life where i could have a child you know and even there's a line in the film where he's like wouldn't it be nice if pinocchio was a real boy and jiminy has this line like a very lovely thought but not at all practical <laughs> at like all there's practical. so many good like one-liners in the movie <laughs> and I, w I was speaking of jiminy too the movie so much is like anchored around that character because he's the everyman he's the audience insert and even just the fact that he's got this sort of hobo get up and then the blue fairy kind of gives him a nice dapper outfit when she makes him the conscience there's almost like this wish fulfillment of like a late 1930s depression era everyman oh, getting yeah. this opportunity and yeah you know all he wants being is the medal you know <laughs> yeah all he wants is the medal all he wants is the chance to have like a better life but then on the path to creating a better practical life, he creates like a better spiritual life for himself as well. And I, I always wondered if that was like something that Disney himself imbued in the film, you know, because 
him him kind of achieving all this material success felt like it was parallel with his like spiritual success as an artist at least in those early films that he was making before he you know kind of got put through his paces with uh, other things like the war and the strike and, and the strike, uh, all yeah. manner of other that's realities a, that that's such an amazing um observation Andrew. i really love that because I would, you know, after the war and after the strike, he really took his eyes off animation for quite a, a long period. He yeah, really just he left did. The kind of central, and it was only when he came back with the Jungle Book, which I would argue is that's my favorite Disney film, right? But it, it's so parallel to Pinocchio because it's personality focused. Yes, right. Yes, it, and that's that's Walt coming back in and saying we've lost kind of where we were going let's bring it back to this and even it's the same as pinocchio the pinocchio is um a series of short stories like these adventurous tales by carlo collodi the, the italian author and their um serials right adventure serials or whatever way you'd say it. it's the same as rudyard kipling's jungle book they're just sh stories right and he just kind of goes in and goes there's a great character who's going to be the heart of the film you know with pinocchio it's jimmy cricket or the talking cricket and went um the jungle book it's blue he's like let's make him you know a bum he's a jungle bum same as yep. jimmy cricket you know it's almost the same thing nearly it's fascinating yeah pinocchio one thing i wanted to mention it was like even though it was their second film it was like the first of a type of film that disney would make every once in a while sort of like the the title character who has a best friend who's a mentor figure yes uh and there's like a a, a signature song like once upon a when you wish upon a star and then you've got pinocchio and jiminy and then in aladdin you've got friend like me and aladdin and the genie and then like you said jungle book you've got mowgli and baloo and the bare necessities like it, there was a certain kind of best friend mentor storytelling dynamic that i think fit the brand so perfectly when they weren't doing the the princess fairy tales that was kind of like they sort of made the other type of Disney film as their second mm. film. <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. <laughs> uh, first and second, and they're their main yeah. type. And then once in a yeah. while, like a strange, bizarre other film, like Fantasia, where you're just like, okay, yeah, what's, the uh, experimental what's film. On what, one thing I love about Aladdin, actually, not to, to, to go on a tangent, is that it kind of takes the princess formula uh, and the Pinocchio formula and marries them together in a really satisfying way. Like the way that you get the sort of adventure of a film like Pinocchio and the kind of comedic dynamic of the, the Robin Williams character who's kind of like the Jiminy, but then you get that, that princess fairy tale um, payoff that always works so well in a Disney film. Uh, Aladdin, Aladdin's a great movie, but, but you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can talk about Aladdin all day too. Yeah, yeah. But, but, with, with Pinoc yeah, but with Pinocchio though, like you said, I mean, it's just try everything, show that there's no limits it's why I always come back to the film and I wouldn't come back to it just for the craft. I could, I could revisit Fantasia for that. It's, it's the personalities, it's the characters and, and the richness of voice. Like even just Walter Catlett as Honest John, he was like this iconic live action character actor from the period, but he'll probably be best remembered for his voice work as Honest John because it's just so perfect and delicious and and even even though he's like devious right he's got this devious nature but he's so likable the whole way through <laughs> yeah. and you know he's like pretending to be the doctor and looking at the notes and you're just like wow yeah. this is i'd be fooled by him no problem and then <laughs> off he goes hi diddly d you know <laughs> and he's having a great time and then yet he's he's just acting the whole time you know and yeah you don't just see his devious nature. You also see when he's engaging with the coachman, he's like, oh, this is a low level, yeah. you know, guy who is w in way over his head <laughs> suddenly yeah. because he thought he did a great job at this like one specific thing. You know? I, yeah, he, he's a petty grifter with a lot of charisma. But and I and I love that in a film about right and wrong, there's still like a moral spectrum among the bad guys. Uh, like yeah. Honest John is like, I trick people, I grift them for money. Occasionally, I might off somebody. If yeah, it's a really he was bad fine guy. about that, wasn't he? He's yeah, like, oh, do I have who, to? He's like, yeah, who do we have to? Uh, and then the coach was like, no, no, nothing yeah. like that. <laughs> but I like that Honest John is sort of horrified at what the coachman does, which is child trafficking. 
right? And like selling them into slave labor after they turn into mules. And he's kind of like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kill a random <laughs> bad bloke for you, but I'm not into like the child trafficking thing. Like yeah. the fact that he's sort of really put off by it. And then the coachman's like, no, you're going to help me, and here's why. Like, yeah. it's the, Well, it's, he did just sell a boy to Stromboli. <laughs> like, literally that's the that's scene true, before. that's true. Yeah, that's so, true. yeah, I guess he, yeah. he's inconsistent, just like real yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess he thought it was like a the, the live puppet thing. He's like, that's okay, that's not a real boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, but uh, you're right. And then people like Stromboli is such a strong character as well. And you've got Bill Teitler's animation that just oh, my goodness, so like big and boisterous and huge the and camera shakes when he moves when he slams yeah. the table and when he jumps <laughs> yeah. it's it's man there's even just watching it again last night when he locks pinocchio in the the cage there's like this overshoot even even watching it at at normal speed you could see like the overshoot on his hand it like flares up when he locks it to give it that little punctuation it's just so many amazing choices it's just constant constant amazing choices <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, i think you know it's funny when you were talking about the brave locomotive and you're talking about uh, casting the animators but you're, or they had their own pieces right this is something and i know i talked about the jungle book this is something that i think they disney really excelled at was the right person for the right character you know what yeah. I mean? Um, you give Milt Cowell Pinocchio when he figured it out originally in the in the kind of pencil test he was doing. You've got Bill Teitler for Stromboli. You can handle that big, strong presence. People like Art Babbitt and the subtlety he can get into Geppetto. And then you've got Freddie Moore, you know, and Lampwick and the, I think... Who, who looks watching. like Lampwick, Freddie? It's like a self-caricature. <laughs> it's a self-caricature, yeah. He's just animating himself. <laughs> Drinking yep. and smoking and having a great time, and uh, <laughs> but it it also is you know the I think out of the nine old men, eight of them worked on this right. So it's this yeah. great, it's this great moment in time where the full strength of the studio was all present. After the strike, you know, a lot of people left and blah blah blah, and a lot of people fell out with Walt. But you, everyone's firing really on full cylinders of excitement whereas i would say later yeah. on for me the jungle book is when they're all firing on all cylinders of excitement plus experience because yes. they're yep. they're not just assigned characters in the jungle book they're assigned scenes which is a very different approach right so yeah. it's not just frank thomas doing baloo the whole time it's him and ollie taking on most of the scenes and you can see in the jungle book when when milk calls suddenly animates baloo and <laughs> I, I, I used to joke with a friend, Milk Call animated Baloo condescendingly. Like, ah, this guy's an idiot. I'm going to animate him like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> so he was like, Bagheera, Bagheera. <laughs> oh, you heard me, huh? And the way B Milk animates him, it's like he's got an opinion about the intelligence of this character. <laughs> you can feel it And then it when Frank through. Thomas animates Baloo, it's like kind of a more sensitive, like nuanced. But I, I, I enjoy... I enjoy the contrast. <laughs> Mil Milk Call animates Baloo the way Bagheera sees Baloo. Oh, that's <laughs> so good. Whereas Frank and Ollie animate Baloo and Mowgli the way they see each other, you know? It's yeah, exactly. Like in a yeah, loving embrace. Exactly. I couldn't tell you which of the nine old men didn't work on it. I thought maybe I can all tell of you. them. I can tell you. It wait, wait, was, was, it, was it less? I'm pretty sure it is uh, Mark Davis didn't work on it. I'm very oh, that's it right. Mark. It was Mark Davis. Yeah. Mark Davis. Was he, was he in story on Bambi at the time? I think I must double check it. But I know I went through the credits just yesterday when I rewatched it. And I noticed everyone's name except for Mark Davis. So I was just like, uh -huh. Mark's not there. Mark's not there. I, I yeah. wasn't sure maybe if he wasn't just like a, one of the the rank and file animators on it or if he, he was doing he something been, else to be fair but you know all the the animation directors were like milt and freddie and ward yeah. kimball and eric larson and um frank Willie Ratherman and exactly and, uh, yeah. whereas the rank and file animators were like ollie and les clark and john lansbury and stuff you know yeah lansbury so. was working with norm ferguson on uh honest john and gideon but but yeah speaking of like great characters and the nine old men and it, it it's such a cool it, it's like a party that everyone was a part of for the most part like you had norm ferguson who was like doing the pluto gag cartoons from the 30s he's leading on honest john and 
Ferguson was actually the one who brought the story to Disney. So it's he's the reason Disney made the movie, which is incredible. And then you had, like you mentioned, Fred Moore doing Lampwick. You had, so Fergie and then Fred Moore kind of are like still big presences on the film. And then the nine old men are like up and coming. But then you also had Bill Tytla and Art Babbitt, who in another timeline without the strike, without the falling out, would have continued. It would have been the 11 old men, probably. Yeah, definitely. Because, yeah. though, I mean, Babbitt and, and Tytla, their work is astonishing. Like, it, to a degree where you're like, they're criminally left out of the history books. I mean, they, they deserve a much bigger footprint than they got because the work they were doing so early on is just, it, it's mind-blowing. And you can really see how much the the soon-to-be nine old men were kind of reaching for this craft that Babbitt and, and Tytla had, had set so early on. The Geppetto stuff. Shots of Geppetto where you're like, who, yeah. oh my God, oh, this is so well done. You can see scenes where they're all interplaying. But what I was so, would always, uh, I wouldn't say brought me out of the story, but made me aware that I was looking at something of multiple art forms is when the blue fairy appears and she's so oh, yeah. delicate and she's got this transparency and she just doesn't feel like she fits totally in the world oh, around she's rotos- them. Oh, she's rotoscoped. Ah, she's yeah. rotoscoped, yeah. That's yep. why, yeah. It's like a, this kind of ethereal, different presence and because um, I know they were using um, rotoscope reference for um, uh who even for Jiminy, oh, like they were Jiminy, even for the yes, cartooniest Jiminy. characters, they would still shoot reference. And Walter Catlett performed his own live action reference for Honest John, which I tried finding. There's not a lot of it out there, but man, like if you've ever seen Bringing Up Baby, he plays this kind of like blowhard local sheriff who, you know, keeps getting thwarted by Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn, but he's basically playing a more like civil defender version of honest john <laughs> <laughs> he's like a little bit more yeah there's there's some great physical comedy and he he moves in real life like a milk call character like the way he strikes a pose and points his finger it's like it, milk call was very much animating the way that live actors performed which is interesting to kind of see you see the influence on everyone's animation style when you watch films from the period especially like the best actors from the period. But uh, sorry, I, I interrupted you. No, you didn't <laughs> the blue, at all. The blue fairy and rotoscoping. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's the point is like you can see the, the style of people developing because Milt, obviously, people consider the best draftsman amongst the group, right? And yeah. I had a great conversation with um, James Baxter before and he told me when he went down, he pulled out Milt's drawings from the, the morgue, they called it at the time. Yeah, the morgue. He was, he was just trying to figure out how he constructed a scene, you know, how he went through it. And he realized he just did most of it in his head. <laughs> there was like no yeah. clues as to like breaking down specific things. He just kind of went and did it. And, um, you know, Milt, obviously everyone loves Milt Call. If anyone's a 2D animator and they love Disney, Milt is there. But people like Art Babbitt or Bill Titler specifically. I mean, what people remember of Bill is Stromboli and um, yeah. Chernabog, right? They're the two big ones that people would say for Bill. The thing I love about Titla versus Call is like titla has got the draftsmanship. Maybe, maybe you you could compare the spacing, like the spacing of Titla's stuff is a little more spontaneous, whereas like Milt's spacing kind of follows through with like perfect physical ease. But Titla's stuff is so... He makes choices that no other animator in the studio would have made, I think, just in terms of how, um, I don't know, how layered and textured. It almost looks like he straight aheaded the performance just to make it very particular and very specific, right? Like every single every single part of Stromboli, it's like, oh, it's I can't imagine him. breaking that yeah. down. It feels like, that feels like a one man show, just like tracking all those jiggling, shaking, moving parts on that character. Yeah. I mean, you could have somebody follow you up, but those would be long conversations. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm a fan of long conversations, but uh, yeah, yeah, because when I was rewatching it, I was really paying attention to 
stromboli because obviously the first thing you do your your eyes go to their eyes and you're checking the the facial animation but when you see him strike a pose and everything's moving and jiggling yeah and, you know how he chooses and that little horse whinny that he does when he's angry and you know that <laughs> yes. kind of noise it's just <laughs> exactly yeah it's just this i, I don't know it, there's there's a subtlety in the exaggeration which sounds like a kind of paradox but uh, yeah anyways like you said we could talk about this for, <laughs> for well, I, I know what you mean though it's exaggerated but it but it's nuanced it feels like it came from a real performance and man like the the, the characterizations of villains they all feel like real people even honest john he's like a talking fox he feels like a real guy like i've been in la for I've been in LA for 14 years and I feel like, yeah, I've met a couple Honest Johns for sure. And I've met a couple Strombolis. Like, it, 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 it feels. Have you met any Gideons? <laughs> plenty of Gideons. There's yeah. one in every, there's one in every production studio. Yes. So there's, they don't carry around giant mallets, but, you know, yeah. they tow the line. They tow but the it's, line. It, yeah, it's, it, it's funny how Pinocchio is like, a film populated by villains. I mean, it's a, it's a moralistic story, and yes, yeah. I, I kind of I kind of like the aggressive moralism of it because not because I'm religious or because I you know want to you know slap someone's wrist, but I think it just imbues stakes on the story that that gives it a fuel, it gives it an energy. Like you have to be good, or these terrible things will happen. But the terrible things that happen, they're all so convincing. Like, yes, yeah. people are getting grifted and hoodwinked and kidnapped all the time. Like, to this day, it's like the most normal thing that these terrible things would happen. And so there's a timelessness to the, the tragedy in the film mm. that these things are always happening. There's always somebody trying to put one over on someone else. And trafficking is still a major issue. And the, the reasons to kind of be cautious and and look out for yourself and and kind of hold your loved ones close is is very palpably felt in Pinocchio and I think for that reason I really appreciate it but then the fact that it's got all those things but it goes way out of its way to be one of Disney's most entertaining movies because of the characters it's a it's a huge accomplishment that I think it, it maybe is a underappreciated because it's such an old film you know, it was appreciated in this time, but I think looking back on it now through that lens, there's a lot to value about it and take from it. Well, those first five films, you know, are just, ex in terms of, I always say that like those first five Disney films are the most experimental films you'll ever see in terms of pushing the art form forward. And it's unfortunate the strike happened and, you know, Disney had a very particular way of handling it and it pushed them away from everything. You know, you could imagine how much faster things would have developed if he'd stayed with his eyes on it, right? I and, think so, you know. And, and kept everyone together because people start to splinter and leave and he had his favorites then. And, but when it comes to Pinocchio, what I always appreciated, and I think people might not think about it, but that one scene in the Red Lobster Inn where you're showing the villains together, right? Yeah. There's no real need for that scene at all. You could just meet Honest John again and they could add in a kind of a line as to, well, off to Pleasure Island now and you could show him collecting money. But there's like a moment of humanizing these, uh, the threat, right? Like you're talking yeah. about it, the kind of moral complexity that exists within the world where you're saying Monstro is a force of nature, sure right that any but he does have personality but every other threat that appears is something that can absolutely occur to you walking down the street you know 100%. yeah and how do you contrast that because the best storytelling is contrast is you have the most innocent trusting character ever to walk <laughs> on screen you know <laughs> who's conscious by the way is not very good Consi gives up on him you know it's just like oh i guess he wants to be an actor oh well good luck pinocchio you know what does an actor what need, does an a, actor conscience need with a conscience for anyway. exactly yeah. <laughs> jimmy has like, got some great zingers in the movie a very lovely thought not at all practical what does an actor yeah. need with a conscience there's so many just man i get why people fell in love with that character too cliff edwards He's, he's the walk-on, uh, you know, 
doing okay, but not great, but not terrible parental figure. He's a relatable, <laughs> he's a relatable parental figure. Cause yeah. Even like when the blue fairies, like you get to be the conscience. He's looking at his suit. Pinocchio's there. He's like, "Oh yeah, I almost forgot about you." <laughs> kind of like a negligent parent. <laughs> oh, he's immediately negligent. Immediately. Yeah, immediately. Yeah, th- there's. <laughs> he doesn't even, doesn't even wake up at the same time as him in the morning. He's like late. You know, he's, <laughs> he's late. He's running after him, and then he's like, "Oh well, maybe he shouldn't be an actor." He's like, "Well, I want to be." Oh, okay. Uh, good luck then. Yeah, on Pleasure Island, when he gets told off, he's just like, okay, well, good luck. Make a fool out of yourself, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he's just so like, he, yeah, he actually says jackass in a Disney yeah, movie, too. Make a jackass out of yourself. He does, yeah. The, the, the line is like, maybe you should take orders from your grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's good. And you're right, the casting of the voice, which, again, as far as I know, <laughs> is like a, another thing that Disney did well, which was casting a famous voice right casting a personality yeah. which it the original just... robin williams like celebrity casting yeah <laughs> exactly yeah um which is rare you know very very rare and it didn't happen again for a long time with disney really you know yeah they had they had phil harris who was kind of like rat pack adjacent time. he was in a couple of their movies for a few years there aristocats uh yeah and, robin um, hood and jungle book robin hood yeah playing Baloo again and <laughs> I, when i was a kid i literally thought it was like Baloo again just like you know like because because there was like tailspin and that was Baloo flying an airplane and then there's robin hood it's like oh it's Baloo, but he's he's like a robin hood guy now and then there's jungle book where it's like just like origin Baloo, original Baloo. <laughs> the different Baloo <laughs> stages yeah there's brown Baloo, origin Baloo, and pilot Baloo. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, but you know, the funny thing about the Jungle Book was when they cast Phil Harris, all the animators were like, What are you doing? You know, and they came in, he gave him the script, and he's like, I can't say these words. So they're like, Okay, say however you want. And he was just Phil Harris, he was just being himself, and that became blue, you know, <laughs> what a wild yeah. swing. But you're right, it totally was. I can't think of a film between Pinocchio and up until that stage that is like personality cast you well know, and, and jiminy actor. cricket he kind of looks like cliff edwards too and like ward kimball was working on the design it was like a cricket that it was like kind of a cricket in a in a suit then it's like a slightly more mickey mouse cricket then it's just straight up now it's just full-on mickey mouse cricket but it kind of also <laughs> looks like cliff edwards with the round face and yeah you know the the, the bulging eyes like it, <laughs> that voice coming out of it just felt natural but uh yeah man like just all the nine old men, the original Disney animators, Babbitt and Tightla, like then all these great character actors mixing character acting animation with epic spectacle. That is that's a delicious combination. Yeah, because it did feel now I've I've my own opinions on epic in, in terms of like what that means. I don't think there's many and I harp on about this all the time. So sorry for anyone who's heard this before. But like I think there's very few animated films that that kind of sit in the epic space and maybe in my head epic space means a david lean or a kira kurosawa film right? oh yeah that, that, that is that a better scale. use of it yeah yeah <laughs> but i would say like in terms of pinocchio the you know that scene where they go down through this the town in the morning and it's like they're using the multiplane or um how all the little people feel like little dolls running around the village and it just kind of tricks your mind these beautiful vistas like the the kind of design of um the spaces and we haven't even talked about geppetto's workshop with all the clocks and the oh my you goodness know, faces yeah. carved into everything like the production design on it is just astounding like it's so particular the the amount of calories on screen it's like just <laughs> <laughs> I heard Glenn Keane use that analogy once for animation with a lot of calories in it. And I was like, that's such a great way of capturing (laughs) just like the the effort on screen. Mm. I I had a note I wanted to mention just like the shot where Monstro the whale sneezes. They're rendering like the the shading. It's almost like dry brush, like three-dimensional shading on the whale. And then there's all the water rippling around it. The smoke coming out. And like dozens of seagulls that are super tiny, like flying away. And then when he actually sneezes, the water splashing, it's 
it's insane. It's like, how long did one frame of this film take? Nothing else looks like that in the entire Disney catalog. It's just, it's like dumping paint, just layers and layers <laughs> of paint onto the cell. Yeah. But it all lands perfectly. And to create this masterpiece, it's it's really something. Uh, just the... That whole monster sequence. Like when the, and they've just put in waves whenever they need it. They're, oh, we need a big wave. Let's put it in. Okay, now it's calm, you know. But it still makes <laughs> yeah. sense for the for the scene and like the geography of how people are moving. I was thinking about it. I was like, he's... You can't outrun a whale in what, but then I was like, stop thinking this and just enjoy the the fact that he's swimming backwards toward land and you know monsters jumping out of the water and you see all the you know the spray and the foam and the waves and the the distortion of the water and oh, everything yeah. on that as well. But then, like you said, the texturing on the animal and and that's something I noticed originally with Figaro, like white outlines on Figaro and stuff, you know, for a black cat. They 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 made really good choices in terms of um color design on characters and texturing on characters that I've never and you're right, I don't think I've ever seen since. Maybe in Fantasia or something. It was but, it was very expensive and even just Yeah. It when Pinocchio has the donkey ears, the way the ears transition into his head, there's a little kind of like airbrushed effect every frame and it, and it and it and it cooks a little bit but it cooks in a way that's satisfying it's like you feel the i don't know like the artistic effort is satisfying to watch because it's not boiling and swimming all over the place but it's got like a sizzle to it that just makes it pop you know like it's delicious yeah delicious exactly you know yeah <laughs> i know what you mean yeah. but as well you know they have when we talk about the kind of donkey transformation, that scene of Lambwick transforming is just sheer horror. Really, That's it's uncomfortable horrifying. to watch. Like, really horrifying. And he's pawing at him with his hands changing. Yeah. Then they cut the shadow, like the use of shadow in this as well. It's just the the tone that they're finding in stories they go through is just astounding. Really. Well, Walt Disney himself was a fan of both Hitchcock and Frank Capra. And this film, I think you feel those influences the most potently. There's a story that uh, Walt Disney actually asked Alfred Hitchcock to direct Sleepy Hollow for the Disney studio. So that would have been the first big name live action crossover into Disney animation from a directing standpoint. Hitchcock passed, but when they made Sleepy Hollow, Disney was basically like, let's make it feel like Hitchcock. <laughs> but I feel like he had already been doing that seven years earlier on Pinocchio or eight or nine years earlier on Pinocchio. So that, but, but the personalities and the, the kind of richness of character and, and the soulfulness of it, that all feels very Frank Capra to me. Like Jiminy Cricket feels like a Frank Capra character. And even, uh, um, I think Dickie Jones, the voice of Pinocchio, he was actually in Mr. Smith goes to Washington that same, yes. <laughs> or, the, or the year before. So there was a lot of like Capra overlap. Uh, but yeah, the, the Hitchcock influence on the Lampwick sequence, especially like it's it, it's cool to see Disney kind of really engaging with cinematic devices and sensibilities where like even the other features being made by Fleischer, they kind of just felt like cartoon features. But Disney was like doing cartoons with cinematic language to them uh, is one, one thing astonishing. That always reminds me of that and it's not particularly in Pinocchio but I think it's in Dumbo when like um, I can't remember the mouse's name now but oh, uh, Timothy like, Mouth is yes and he's coming up to the lamp and they have that like Nosferatu kind of <laughs> yeah. shadow like go up across the wall I was like he's re they're really pulling these references from they <laughs> are know, from live yeah action. they are but it closes the gap right and that's you know it starts to and people lament this when it comes to animation because of course animation can be anything and and it should be it's an incredible art form but when you're trying to tell a story that is connecting with people pushing too far into abstract you lose them whereas if you're pulling you start to pull toward more cinematic influences you really are starting to pull people's attention into the story and yes there's a lot more i agree yeah and uh bringing a baby and um philadelphia story like other like screwball comedies from the time, like you feel that style of acting and characterization, even on this this Disney fantasy cartoon. It's 
it, it was really savvy. Like you feel, well, watching those first five Disney movies, you feel the the savviness of Walt as a, a storyteller operating in his own time. Like the the they feel timeless, but they feel contemporary to that period. And now, flavors of performance or flavors of entertainment that were commonplace back then, now they feel like part of just the Disney brand, the Disney signature. But a lot of what influenced the the flavor of the brand is just the way storytelling felt in the golden age of Hollywood. That's fascinating. That's really fascinating. And I think if you talk about Pinocchio, obviously it didn't do very well when it was released <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, it, it, just... cost, it cost twice as much as Snow White and it got amazing critical reviews, but I think audiences uh, either couldn't access it because of the, the 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 war going on or or maybe they just weren't as interested because it looked frightening or or a little strange but uh Dum dumbo was actually uh fairly successful because they deliberately made that on a much lower budget and then it was more profitable so dumbo was kind of like of the first five it was the cheap one but it's also a lot of people's favorite because it's just so inventive and specific and abstract as well, right? It yeah, just very this abstract. Wild abstraction. Um, yeah. <laughs> a yeah, train because... that's alive and don't ask why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they <laughs> let's sing a song about them. Okay. Yep. That's... No problem. Yeah, pink just... elephants. Why not? Yeah. The yep. Pink elephants. Let's do a whole song about them. Why not? <laughs> just, it's just crazy. Oh, we're gonna, yeah. We're going to spend two minutes of screen time introducing this train character that is not relevant to the plot <laughs> yeah, at all. Exactly. Yeah. But it, that's so captivating. I don't know what it is. I I always remember that sequence as being like, oh, my God, we're going on a journey now. And then yeah. it's like, journey's over, kids. We're back in the circus. <laughs> the next time you see the train, he's just like whistling sadly in the rain. That's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, yeah, it's funny. People, I'm sure people, anyone who's familiar with that time period, they know that, you know, Snow White made a ton of money that they then yeah. spent on the next four and the only one to make money back was Dumbo again, right? Yeah. Because Fantasia yeah. was a total, just by sheer, the way it was set up to have like the sound system and they just couldn't bring that around to all the cinemas. Ah, oh, um, wow. And then I Bambi, didn't know that I'm detail. Sure, That's, but... That makes sense. Yeah, Bambi, I think, must I don't know how well Bambi did. I imagine I had similar struggles with um, mm. the war market. Yeah, some but for a couple of years there, it was hard to access the European market. But, the, but Bambi was made for less than Pinocchio, and and Dumbo was made for less than Bambi. I think. I mean, Bambi came out after, but yeah, it was it was that was a tough couple of years after Fantasia. Uh, but it's funny you can feel the money on screen with Pinocchio, right? Especially oh my gosh, that whole so much stuff. But even even the way. Um, everything looks even that underwater sequence before they meet monstro you know and how everything's moving and shimmering well, they have and... the they have the reflections mm -hmm. moving on the on the on the ocean floor and that which you see in disney films for decades after like in little mermaid i know they referenced how it was done in pinocchio to get a similar feel but whenever they say monstro have you guys seen monstro and all the fish scatter they do that that really quick ripple and I don't know if they're using like a glass distortion in front of the camera to cut and then moving it to kind of make it ripple quickly, but it's an incredible effect. And I was like, they didn't do stuff this interesting and layered for literal decades, like probably not until the 90s when they could do computer assisted effects. Like it, it was just, it's crazy how there was almost half a century of less than compared to Pinocchio. Wow. What, on a technical a, level what a terrible touch point <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but it, 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 it's it's fascin it's fascinating though well when i was a kid I, the 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 draftsmen listening are going to hate me for saying this but when i was a kid i didn't care for the look of the xerography films i preferred the look of like pinocchio and peter pan and snow white i i because as a kid i was like those look magical like those look amazing and then as a kid watching like jungle book or sword in the stone i'm like that's a dirty drawing <laughs> you know what i mean like it's, it it's not that it, and then as an adult i realized that's an amazing dirty drawing you know yeah what I mean? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing but as a kid it was just a dirty drawing yeah uh and, and and i knew that they were moving well i knew that it was like animated well especially compared to television like i didn't not appreciate it 
but it I, it wasn't until college that I really like fell in love with Sword in the Stone and Hundred One Dalmatians. But as a kid, it was more like I want to watch the gorgeous ones because <laughs> that just stood out to me more. It, 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 as a kid, you kind of feel the the effort on screen or like the the resources on screen and the vibrancy of it. The like even a less yeah. expensive yeah. film like Dumbo as a kid felt more vibrant to me than like Sword in the Stone. And Sword in the Stone is very much like an animator's movie and a character designer's movie. And I feel like the first five are more like far reaching with like their, their look of picture and the overall production value. They have just more of like a general audience in mind, but also a, uh, like just the level of artistry. It's like mixing technology and art and general audience and appeal general audience appeal in a really satisfying way yeah and it kind of became the main staple of the successful disney films right because if if you were to say to anyone sword in the stone i don't think it's in most people's top 10 uh, outside of animation like uh, favorite films you know yeah i i, I remember in college before before i even started doing my animation videos or anything like that i uh, one of the precursors to that was trying to figure out sword in the stone <laughs> i was just like what is this about <laughs> why <laughs> and i was just like writing down you know learning about it, my thoughts on it and then eventually i was like oh maybe there's something here and i went off and talked about everything else and i never came back to sword in the stone <laughs> which is so I, I i feel like the charm of sword in the stone uh, outside of just the incredible character design and draftsmanship and it, it, it Sword in the Stone has great personality animation and it's similar to Pinocchio. Like Merlin is a great character in the vein of like Geppetto and Honest John and Wart is like an, a true innocent like Pinocchio. And then you've got like Sir Ector and, and Kay. <laughs> They're just these these just buffoons, <laughs> these blowhards. Disney was great at blowhards yes, and specifically yeah. Milk Hall at Disney animating blowhards and buffoons. It's just everyone in the movie is kind of a buffoon. And I think if you're into that, it works yeah. for you. But uh, yeah. I think Merlin is one of Disney's most charming standalone characters, though. Like, and I think Merlin kind of carries the film. And, and Archimedes, <laughs> Merlin and Archimedes have like kind of a like a late stage Geppetto and Figaro dynamic going on. <laughs> like Archimedes is even more grumpy and Merlin is even more bumbling. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like pulled out to its extreme. Yeah, it truly <laughs> yeah. is. I, and I, I love like the old couple kind of feel, like bickering old couple. <laughs> yeah. Who, I do. who? I'd like to know who. <laughs> yeah. What always stuck with me with that film is because they said it obviously in England, it's just so wet and dull and just, you know. <laughs> That's it's all a drab the, movie. It's so all, drab. all the all the xerography movies are have like a British slant to them, which fits like the drabness of the way they look. Like Winnie the Pooh, Sword in the Stone, Hundred One Dalmatians. They um, they're all drab, and I'd say the Jungle Book started to break that because it's in India finally. And that's right. Color in, and, in uh, India gives it that pop of color, but it's still got the British drab veneer over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the of the um, the elephants, and you know. Yeah, and then uh, what, what, what the Aristocats was set in France, and that kind of has like a proto triplets of Belleville kind of look to oh, it. Yeah. They yeah. put some of those some of the French <laughs> colors in there. Yeah, yeah. the Robin Hood were back in England, so it's back just drab England. as hell, just yeah. drab as hell, just Make just rain, kind of baby. like a gray green and gray. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit more vibrant than uh, Sword in the Stone, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's just. <laughs> It took a while to get out of the drabbery, you know, and um, that's probably why the Jungle Book, I think, always stuck out to me. I used to pretend I was Mowgli as a child, like just run around in red underwear and <laughs> pretend I was in the jungle. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And just just uh, looking for bears to be friends. Just looking for bears <laughs> and, and rocks to like scratch your back against or trees, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that, that was it for me. But um you know, it, 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 I don't know how to bring this back to Pinocchio. So I'm gonna let you do that. <laughs> I, I, I feel, I feel like I'm gonna get hate mail from animators who love the xerography films for making fun of their, their dirty <laughs> drabberies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there is something like it is. Well, maybe I shouldn't go on this tangent. No, no, I'll sit with you to some degree in here. I, to me, something like the Jungle Book, I would say, is the best drawn. Of yes, the Disney films oh, yeah. definitely, and you can feel that. But the xerography is great to capture 
energy in pencils but it doesn't capture the pencil line perfectly it has like it dots it right because it's not getting the full grade of it and that is what always bothered me you know about the uh, xerography of like a whisk whisker you've then got the texture of the pencil around it but it seems like in dots and lines it doesn't feel right it kind of breaks up a little bit it's it's exactly you don't get like the perfect fidelity of like a like a digital scan or something yeah, like or that or something like the tale of the princess kaguya where you can see the full oh like, my goodness uh, yeah. penciling of it you know and um, yeah but they tried you know and it saved money <laughs> so it's, it's, I, I, it's, one thing that's that's interesting to me about like a, a film like roger rabbit which is you know they're obviously xeroxing the cleanup and then they're using the uh the traditional ink and paint colors palette and look of the 1940s but then they're doing like like 1980s visual effects with like the industrial light and magic like blurring and of the mats and everything so they would animate the the shadow and highlight mats on a layer just like they would in pinocchio but then ilm is doing like a bloom and like a blur to it so roger rabbit is like this cool mix of like 40s production value 80s visual effects and then like the geography technique but trying to make it disguised as the 1940s <laughs> but i don't know yeah it's probably because of film capture right that those (laughs) early films look so gorgeous and you can still it could be yeah you know it could be because i was imagining fidelity yeah imagine imagine pinocchio done like digitally by like you know in, in like the early 2000s by one of disney's like partner studios where it's like yeah it's like it's clean and it's precise but something about it captured on film and cells like makes it look the way it does it's hard it's hard to explain but even like a blu-ray digital restoration of pinocchio you can't like undo the fact that it was done on film and like has certain feel to it and that's why i'm grateful for something like disney plus where they put the highest fidelity they can of that version up there so if you yeah have the right oh i watched the the 70th anniversary blu-ray that i bought back in like 2010 <laughs> <laughs> and then I watched the 14-year-old bonus features with a much fresher-looking Leonard Malton talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to watch the VHS, you know, so you get those lines and the oh, um, yeah. and the breakup of sound. In fact, actually, just, funny story, my, uh, my early exposure to Disney films was generally true Dutch because my, even though oh, the wow. films were in English, all the stuff around it was Dutch because my mother's friend lived in the netherlands and she would tape films off the tv and send us the crappy vhs recording and it would just like include the ads in between the films and stuff and for a long time i i thought that they were just parts of the film because i was so young when i was watching it and it was only later when i'd see something on like um or came to my senses i realized that they were advertisements you know which was wild but everything was so dirty then i couldn't really appreciate the the art of it i was just more enraptured by the style i i was so in love with the vhs version of beauty and the beast as a kid that when i saw beauty and the beast in blu-ray i was like this looks like a different movie why is it so bright and saturated (laughs) exactly (laughs) i need this to feel like dark and grungy that's my beauty and the beast (laughs) yeah exactly and i need it to be a square by the way i need it to be four by three blurry (laughs) grungy dark desaturated that's my That's my Beauty and the Beast. I'm surprised you haven't made a blurry, dark, desaturated short film yet. Yeah, why? Well, yeah, I should have. Your your stuff <laughs> is so vibrant and colorful, and your your <laughs> there, there's is. some shots there's some shots in in Locomotive where I wanted it to go so dark that you almost had to like squint to see. Um, it's hard to get that balance just right digitally. Sometimes I think film just naturally does that better. But I don't aspire to shoot a 2D film on film, but I like trying to like mine the look of it like why it feels a certain way yeah hard to do right very hard to do it is it is hard to do but i, th- I think that was a great um success of something like the brave locomotive is you know your your tonality throughout the story is you're using very deliberate color choices to underscore the kind of moments in the film which um but the the color choices are very beautiful and delicious you know delicious oh again. thank you well i had yeah. i had an amazing art director early on back in 2009 when i storyboarded it one of my classmates at the minneapolis college of art and design casimir iskander they did basically all the story beats in the film and then a color script and even 
A decade plus later, when I revisited the film with a new art director, Amy Lewis from the UK, we always went back to Kaz's color script with these bold choices, like the bold, like the red sky from the bridge sequence that was from Kaz. Um, and a lot of the, the color palettes on the characters came from Kaz, like the Baron's color scheme came from Kaz's original uh, yeah, original the artwork. green train that's like a slave train. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had done a sketch of that sort of anglerfish train and then Kaz did like the, the color, the look of it. And he changed the design of it a bit too. And, and those design cues uh, got renovated into like the updated version of the film uh, after I started the Patreon. So yeah, Kaz's influence over the film can't be can't be uh, overstated in terms of like the look and feel uh when i present my making of at various places i always say kaz's work is like sarcastic mary blair there was like a sense <laughs> of humor in the drawings that almost <laughs> felt a little bit more cartoon network a little bit more kind of playful but the actual palette and the actual sensibility was very congruent with mary blair and what mary blair would have brought to a similar disney production so having having a person who really just owned that like the fine it's and similar to mary blair the final painted backgrounds don't look exactly like the art but you can see where all those color derivations came from and like why it ended up the way it did do you think you'll ever put up your making of or are you just gonna <laughs> uh i i do actually have like a cue right now of things that i'm gonna put on youtube next up is all eight and a half minutes of the original music recordings that we did because I edited the film down, so there are big sections of music I cut out because I felt it wasn't serving the story in a way that I wanted to tell it anymore. I, I kind of wanted to funnel and focus the... I didn't want to go full Dumbo and just go on like these tangents, whereas originally <laughs> I did. I had like tangents in it. Uh, and so the film is edited to support just the story of Linus and, and the journey he goes on. But um, the unreleased music will be put online with the full color script that Kaz did kind of timed out in the same style as the end credits of the film where there are these kind of like little moviola images um, set to the music, but it'll just be eight, eight and a half minutes of that. And Kaz did over a hundred color thumbs. So it's going to be, I think it'll be exciting for people to see who really love the behind the scenes of the film and want to hear more of that Andrew sister's sound. Because we recorded more cues in that Andrew sister style than appeared in the final film. So that, that'll be a treat for people to see. And it's just six pieces, just the voices uh, and the piano, drums, and bass. So it'll sound very, uh, it'll, it'll sound a little bit more uh, quaint <laughs> than, the more, fi yeah, yeah, than the yeah. final piece. But, yeah. but I also have plans to do um, sort of like a video essay style version of the presentation I give at schools where it'll be maybe like 10 minutes or 15 minutes of my voice narrating it. And then I'll show the slides and kind of cut it together like a video essay with some B-roll. So instead of it just being me standing up at a lectern with images next to me, I'll do it more like a proper YouTube essay. But same content. <laughs> yeah. No, that's really exciting. And you don't know the effect something like that will have on people, you know, the right people who are really looking for that, specifically students or um, anyone who's trying to dig into, I think, inspiration. Like we, I often forget, even from my own stuff, I have no idea the effect that my work can have on someone. I'm not trying to predict it, by the way. Um, but it's like you, you've no idea how something will affect anyone but what you put out there could be the most meaningful thing to someone's life you know and definitely I, th I think that's such a beautiful thing to have as as pinocchio has you know um definitely <laughs> affected you and uh affected me more to jungle book but uh <laughs> <laughs> jungle book is an amazing film i i probably rewatched that one more than any of the other xerography films and probably more than many of the, the the 1950s films too i went through a phase around seven or eight where I, I think that was the one i watched the most probably when i was about the age Mowgli was meant to be <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very light yeah. easy film to watch like it's not a stressful film to watch it's just like you put it on and you can just relax and enjoy like that's that's the, i think one of the great gifts of the jungle book and 
it was like Walt's parting gift as a creator was like, I want to make a film that's just delightful. <laughs> just delightful and fun. And, and he yeah. saw the story that had strong characters and he kept saying to the guys, literally, I quote, don't worry about that icky, sticky story stuff. I'll sort that. You just focus on the personalities, focus on the personalities and just have fun. Give me something fun. And the way he structured the film was just like, Every character essentially gets their own set piece and song and then we'll just move on and we'll just see where it goes, you know, and it's just like, let's yeah. have a bit of fun. Even though it's dark, like the monkeys are kidnapping a child, you know, to, to, to yeah. teach them. And There's he's just singing kidnapping. a great song about it. You know, he's just like, you know, <laughs> show me how to make fire, but let's walk around and play trumpets, guys, you know. Yeah, there and, was there, there was great uh, irony in it. And that was one last thing I wanted to touch on with Pinocchio and and. Eric Goldberg articulated this really well in the making of for Pinocchio, but the irony in the film of like the musical score being uh, triumphant and aspirational when something devious or terrible is happening, <laughs> right? Like every, every sort of element of the filmmaking is supporting contrast and irony to kind of make it, make it feel clever and make it feel self-aware and, and just, Parti like having the the composers participate in the storytelling in that way like Pinocchio is getting tricked but we're gonna have the song be like this bright aspirational actor's life for me kind of song yeah. <laughs> and, and the whole movie kind of has that that intelligence about it that uh that awareness of how to kind of use every instrument of the filmmaking for comedy or for for dramatic effect that's it that's a really great point of the irony that underscores everything because like you said the or as we were saying earlier there's so much there's danger around every corner literally in this film right <laughs> yeah. and, he, and you know failing on geppetto off you go to school and then just sends him out the door this is child's first day in the world you know off you go every parent's nightmare go to yeah. public school and you're immediately kidnapped <laughs> yeah, immediately and sold into into slavery to oh, the, no. uh, oh my know, god oh my god but um, there's like you can't go left or right without hitting some kind of person that's really it, it was actually something I was deeply thinking about while I was rewatching it is, you know, people who sit in a space with a devious nature where they're always trying to one up things or they're trying to get something out of you right it it never truly ends well right it even even the coachman right there's just yeah a, kind of a, a an inherent nastiness to him but then you see all his little henchmen and there's these black blobbish creatures you know who don't seem to have anything uh, other than the kind of darkness that they exist in right it, they're just living in this dark space and and um the irony of something called Pleasure Island, right? <laughs> right. You, know, you know, just that can't be anything good. I, I, it can't I, I, be Eric, anything good. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Goldberg said something in the behind the scenes, like the movie sets up a, a tone and an expectation where you know if you hear the that there's a place called Pleasure Island, you know that it's <laughs> it must be terrible. Like the movie kind of sets you up for that expectation, and that's yeah, that's part of the brilliance of it. Yeah, it's so the irony of everything and like even something like um, Stromboli, you know, and he gets so annoyed about things and then he's given <laughs> Pinocchio that coin and, and there's all you, these... For you, my Yeah, for Pinocchio. you, yeah, just so gently, like, look at this beautiful thing that I presented you and, um, and then just gets up and leaves with it. And that scene of Geppetto looking for Pinocchio and the carriages go past and you're like... He's right there. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, and those carriages, so which were filmed in live action and then printed on cells. It's another incredible try everything kind of technique. There's a shot where Pinocchio is jumping off the carriage and you can see that it's like kind of a live action print of the carriage and they, they kind of like paint it over it to give it some color. But it's it's again like just how do we put this in here? Let's just film it. Yeah, but it, it still fits there. It very does. well like it, it fits into the world quite well and yeah it's kind um, of like a proto version of the cars from 101 dalmatians before before xerography but uh, but yeah i i i i just wanted to impart to everyone listening like pinocchio does kind of have a reputation for being an odd duck of a disney film and there's things about it that are that are strange and scary and dated but 
as a piece of animation history, it just can't be denied. Like, I, I strongly recommend watching it just from the point of view of craft, personality animation, Disney finding a brand and really kind of owning a sort of like identity in terms of like their storytelling and every behind the scenes, every making of every Wikipedia entry about Pinocchio, I just find endlessly fascinating. And I think all of that knowledge enriches the viewing experience of the film. And frankly, I'm always surprised every time I revisit it, just how damn entertaining it is. It it shouldn't be that entertaining for an 84 year old movie. It's kind of like Wizard of Oz, where you're just kind of amazed that it holds up as a as a charming, delightful way to pass the time. I think that's a beautiful point. Yeah. Once they get out of the house, right? Once they get out, of, the house is fun. But once they get out of the house, it's a roller coaster, right? It you is. It's a roller in. coaster. Yeah. yeah. I think that's such a beautiful point to to end on, Andrew. Unless you've got something, unless you've got no. More. I just wanted to. Yeah. I just wanted to express. Like, why revisit that film now when there's so many contemporary new types of stories to watch? There's no shortage of great things to watch, but uh, if you're in love with the Disney brand or that flavor of storytelling, I think Pinocchio is a real treasure worth revisiting and finding new inspiration in despite its its age. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming on and, and sharing that positive Thank you, message. Cole. This yeah. was such a delight. I look forward to chatting again. Yeah.